Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. This program is called Quick Study Television. Now it's Quick Study because we go through the Bible in one year. And that's Quick Study, that's I'll tell you. quick. And uh, we go from Genesis to Revelation. And one of the people that helps us put this together is Corey. Corey, what'd you do today? Today we're going to be looking into the Dead Sea Scrolls for some help with the Psalms. Very good, the Dead Sea Scrolls. What an amazing topic. That is excellent. You studied today. What yes, did you do? I did. We are going to talk about the Songs of Ascent. The Songs of Ascent. Excellent. And also, Ryan is here. Ryan, what in the world are you doing? Well, today I'm going to be exploring a supposed error in the book of Leviticus. And here's the question. Did Moses call a bat a bird? <laughs> Very good. Okay, excellent, Ryan. I need to tell you that today we're going to talk about a lying tongue in the teaching segment. And this is the worst thing that you will ever face is somebody who lies. Now, we live in a world of hyperbole, so we exaggerate for sake of emphasis. But when that gets out of hand, it's a problem. And God is against it. We'll talk about that and more still to come right here on Quick Study. Today, you and I are going to be taking a look at the book of Psalms, but through a different lens, through the lens of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls were a discovery made in the 1940s, and they revolutionized the world of Old and New Testament studies. Take a look. The Dead Sea Scrolls have been called the most significant biblical find of the 20th century because the ancient manuscript copies found in caves beside the Dead Sea are the oldest surviving manuscript copies of biblical books by around a thousand years, dated to many cases around 200 BC. Also stunning is the amount of preservation of these manuscripts. Full copies of ancient books were found with few missing pieces, plus many fragments of biblical books giving comparisons to our modern Bible and acting as an assurance that the Old Testament was arranged and accepted by that time. One of the interesting avenues of study of the Dead Sea Scrolls is looking at the Psalms preserved by these dry caves of which there were 36 manuscripts found, yet not all of them are the same. There are several examples of straight copies of the biblical book of Psalms following the biblical order and preserving the words of our familiar 150 chapters. Yet there are other manuscript copies of Psalms that differ from the biblical collection in order of Psalms and also by adding more Psalms into the mix. Extra-biblical or apocryphal psalms are an interesting study in and of themselves. Many are attributed to King David, including Psalm 151, an apocryphal psalm that was preserved by one version of the Bible, though rejected by the rest. When first approaching this idea of different versions of the book of Psalms being found, many believers in the inspiration of the Bible are uncomfortable. But as with anything, finds must be seen in their original setting to have a hope of being understood correctly. The scrolls of the Dead Sea are not just biblical scrolls. They contain commentaries and community literature. As a collection of hymns, it's not surprising to find another version of Psalms in this highly religious separatist community, tailoring their worship for their own religious rites. I said earlier before we went into that segment that the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls really impacted not only the study of the Old Testament, but also the New Testament. So I wanted to explain that just a little bit. There are no uh, New Testament documents contained within the, the known Dead Sea Scrolls. 
but instead what the Dead Sea Scrolls do for us is they provide a context, a, a first century Jewish context from which to uh, understand more about the goings-ons that are recorded in the New Testament of the Bible. Uh, and of course, for the study of the Old Testament, there are almost every single book of the Old Testament is represented in the scrolls found in the Dead Sea Caves. And there are also uh, various uh, traditions, teachings, commentaries on these books of the Bible uh, from various Jewish sects, uh, specifically from the Essene, the Essene group as well that uh, Josephus talks about. So if you're familiar with the Roman Jewish historian Josephus, then you've heard him speak of the Essenes. So the Dead Sea Scrolls really revolutionized our understanding of the Old Testament because they pushed back the manuscript copies that we had by a thousand years. So we have now uh, something from a thousand years before the oldest uh, Old Testament doc manuscript copies that we had so we can compare and see if they've changed it all, which of course they haven't. There's only some minor spelling errors. So this is really huge for biblical studies. The lying tongue is difficult to navigate around, even if you're devoted to truth. It's easy to get caught up in the lie. Now, it's one thing to remember that it is staying quiet and not defending yourself that is a good reaction. But when we defend ourselves, we take the position that no one else cares for truth. Or if they do care, they're not powerful enough to deal with it. To the believer in Jesus Christ, that is untrue. Before speaking, we must be assured that God chose us to speak. We must pray through every challenge and discern what spiritual force is coming in against us. This is the best plan of attack. Let God deal with those who are lying. He will always do the right thing. Psalm 120 In my distress I cried to the Lord, and He heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given to you, or what shall be done to you, you false tongue? Sharp arrows of the warrior with coals of the broom tree. Woe is me that I dwell in Meshach, that I dwell among the tents of Kedar. My soul has dwelt too long with the one who hates peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Psalm 120. We live in a world of hyperbole. Now, hyperbole is a word used to identify something that is exaggerated for sake of emphasis. Uh, for example, I've told you a million times to do that. Well, actually, no, you haven't told me a million times, but I get the meaning there. It's exaggerated for the sake of emphasis. And actually, in today's world with Twitter and with Facebook and all the rest of it, that makes it even more difficult because everybody wants to exaggerate to get your point across. And that's interesting. Well, before we get to this, I want to remind you that you can get your Bible guide if you write to us and give an offering in any amount. We'll be happy to send it to you in the United States or Canada. But in, uh, if you want to go to the website, BibleDiscoveryTV.com, BibleDiscoveryTV.com and give there, you can go straight and get the files down on PDF. It's excellent. You'll, you'll love it. That's important. Now, steps of faith. What are we going to talk about? This is Psalm 120. Coming against lying. <laughs> That is not something that is uh, going to make the headlines today. I'll tell you right now. People are probably going to say, well, lying, I'm going to turn away from that. No, coming against lying. This is what the Bible says to us. We're reading Psalm 120 to 126, and looking at Psalm 120, verses 1 to 7, we have something here that we need to look at because this is important. 
You know, they said that once uh, you're in a war, somebody explained wars, and they said, truth gets sacrificed. is the first thing that gets sacrificed. The only difference is that the truth never changes. The truth gets ignored, but it's still the truth. And that's very important for us to remember. So with that in mind, we go here. And this is Psalm 120, verses 1 to 2. It says, In my distress, I cried to the Lord, and he heard me. I said, Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips. Deliver my soul, Lord, from lying lips and from the deceitful tongue. Now that is fascinating. We come to this point and we realize that a lying, deceitful tongue is one of the worst things that we ever face. Beloved, we must allow God to deal with the persons accordingly. I remember one time there was this guy and he came to know Jesus Christ. And of course, one of the commandments, the eighth commandment is don't bear false witness. And as we looked at that, he said to us, well, you know, I, I just lie every time. I have a problem, so I've decided to tell you when I'm lying, so I'll break the habit. Well, every time he said something, he said, you know, I'm lying. That's just a lie. Well, you know, the truth is that within a short period of time, he broke the habit. And I want to tell you something. He was committed to revealing the truth, but many of us are not. And we need to make sure that we stay on target with not lying. And that's also important for me because I love to exaggerate. But it's important that we learn to stay committed to the truth. God is committed to the truth. And we must stay on his level. All right, we go back to the scripture and it says, What shall we be given or what shall be given you? What shall be done to you, you false tongue? Sharp arrows of the warrior with coals of the broom tree. Wow, that's intense. Let me tell you something, a lying tongue invokes God's wrath. If we are honest, we must not become defensive. Now this is important because many times when we're defensive, it's because there's an emotion inside of us that is reacting to what's being told to us. Somebody comes up to us and they say, well, you didn't do that or you didn't do this or whatever, and it's a lie. Well, we feel compelled to defend ourselves. Now, wait a minute, because the minute you start doing that, you have a problem. And this is the area that needs to be very carefully considered in the realm of people who believe in Jesus Christ. And by the way, did you notice at the cross, the crucifixion, they were actually lying about Jesus in front of Pilate and everybody. And Pilate says, do you not hear this, Jesus, King of the Jews? Do you not hear this? Will you not say anything? And Jesus Christ didn't. He didn't defend himself because he was committed to truth and the truth came out and it will come out. And so, beloved, we need to consider this and we need to say, okay, Lord, we need to make sure that we know exactly what we're doing and how we're doing it. Well, we go back to the scripture and we learn something. In verses five to seven, woe is me that I dwell in Meshach, that I dwell among the tents of Kedar. My soul has dwelt too long with one who hates peace. Interesting. He hates peace. And he says in verse 7, I am for peace. But when I speak, they are for war. That is amazing. We learn that a lying tongue engenders conflict and war, not peace. A lying tongue engenders conflict and war, not peace. Beloved, we must be people of peace, not people of war. This is very important. Anybody who is committed in long term to lying and making up stories that aren't real or modifying stories slightly because there's ways you can lie that are not a real lie, but they're kind of slanted. We need to remain committed to truth. And you know what? A righteous man swears to the truth even when it hurts him. The Proverbs tells us that. And so when something happens and, 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 our, and we're responsible, we need to live up to that responsibility. We need to do that. You know, we can't try to blame somebody else. If we're responsible, we need to be responsible. 
And so, beloved, we must remain committed to God's truth and to the way that God tells us to handle truth because truth is very much an act of peace. And Jesus Christ said, blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called the sons of God. I want to tell you something. If we are committed to telling the truth, if we are reasoning to the truth, then God will help us and we will be able to stand true in times of great testing. When someone asks us how old are the Psalms within the Bible, most of us who have read the Psalms many times will say, well, they're at least as old as King David because some of them are claimed to have been written by him. And at least Psalm 90 is as old as Moses. But how do we know that the Bible is being accurate in its representation of this authorship? Take a look. The 150 songs that comprise the book of Psalms are subdivided into five smaller books. The first book, Psalm 1 to 41, is believed to be the oldest collection, while the fifth and last subbook, Psalm 107 to 150, is considered to be the youngest, written during and after the Babylonian exile. Being the first and last books of Psalms, book 1 and 5, have another feature in common. They're the only books that contain acrostic poems that use the Hebrew alphabet to arrange their content. This peculiarity has aided researcher Mitchell First in his captivating article written for Biblical Archaeology Review. First's theory of dating these two books pulls together archaeological finds, ancient manuscript copies, and literary criticism. The ancient Hebrew alphabet is closely related to other alphabets of its time with one distinct feature in its early years, the order of two letters, Ein and P. In eight ancient Hebrew abecedaries, which are scribal copies of the alphabet, the order of the letters, which are today Ein and then P, are switched. With centuries separating these, it is unlikely that each practicing scribe made the exact same mistake. First also points out that in the two earliest Greek copies of Proverbs, the P Ein order is used, as well as in the acrostic sections of Lamentations from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So from the earliest days of the Hebrew alphabet until the Babylonian exile, it seems the order of the letters was P and then Ein. The exile then switched these to Ein P. Applied to Psalms, this means that a reordering of the acrostic poems of Book 1 to a P-Ein model should contextually illuminate the songs. Intriguingly, it works, but it doesn't work in Psalm Book 5. This means, according to the alphabet, Book 1 represents very early authors, while Book 5 authors after the exile. This month, Quick Study TV is pleased to offer two wholesome products to support your study of the Bible. In the delightfully written and informative booklet, More Strange Facts About Heaven, the late Ron Hembry shares perspective and insights into the accounts of heaven found in the Bible. A quick and thoughtful read, this booklet offers discussion on common questions like, Will I work in heaven? For a suggested donation of $10 or more, you can request More Strange Facts About Heaven. We'll send you the booklet and invite you to read along with Ron as he explores the secrets of heaven revealed in the Holy Scriptures. And a DVD documentary called Dragons or Dinosaurs addresses cross-cultural dragon legends with a simple question. Could these dragons have been dinosaurs? In a world where efforts have been made to firmly separate history from supposed legend, this simple question proves both surprising and intriguing. This month, you can also request the DVD, Dragons or Dinosaurs, for a suggested donation of $15 or more while supplies last. Please write or call today.
Thank you for staying with us as we continue to go through God's Word. It is exciting, and this is the Psalms. I love yes. the Psalms. Mm -hmm. And we are having a good time. We've got just a few days left, we do. and then we're moving on to the wisdom literature, which is going to be fascinating. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Right now, Ryan is here. Ryan, what's going on? Moses, who's the author of the first five books of the Bible, has been attacked over and over by critics. Now, this is because they seek to disprove that Moses was getting his information from God. One of these attacks focuses on Leviticus chapter 11, where Moses, who is well-educated in Egyptian curriculum, seems to call a bat a bird. Let's explore this passage. Skeptics of the Bible accuse the scriptures of being littered with contradictions and errors and claim that it is really not the Word of God. Skepticism has risen so fast that it has actually become an epidemic in our modern culture. This is a result of thousands of years of Satan, who is called the father of lies in John 8.44, putting doubts in the minds of mankind. This deception can be traced back all the way to the Garden of Eden when Satan, while tempting Eve, questioned God's words. Did God really say? In a similar fashion, the father of lies has created doubt in many people's minds about the human authors of the Bible, and if God was really speaking through them. Moses, for example, who authored the first five books of the Bible, has been attacked many times. For example, some claim that there is an alleged error in Leviticus 11, 13 to 19. The passage reads, And these you shall regard as an abomination among the birds. They shall not be eaten, they are an abomination. The eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the kite and the falcon after its kind, every raven after its kind, the ostrich, the short-eared owl, the seagull and the hawk after its kind, the little owl, the fisher owl and the screech owl, the white owl, the jackdaw and the carrion vulture, the stork, the heron after its kind, the hoopoe and the bat. The accusation here is that Moses wrongly calls a bat a bird. However, in examining the original Hebrew translation of this passage, we find that the Hebrew word that has been translated as bird is alf, which actually means fowl or winged creature, or to fly, or has a wing. This means that while the Hebrew word does include birds, it is not limited to it. In fact, it could include birds, bats, and even flying insects. This then is simply a mistranslation in the English Bible and is not an error in the original biblical manuscripts. So we see here that the English translators merely mistranslated and limited the Hebrew word auf to bird, but in actuality the Hebrew word means fowl or winged creature or to fly or has a wing. Therefore, a better translation of this passage might be, and these you shall regard as an abomination among the winged creatures. Here again we see that this is simply a translational issue and that there is no error in the original biblical manuscripts. You know, that's interesting, Ryan, because at, the, at one time, you know, that wasn't an issue. Uh, but now today, we define everything and we're taking a look at everything and picking at the Bible. Now it's an issue. Mm -hmm. And I find that to be absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Ryan. That is a good report uh, today. Report. Uh, in the translation issue. Mm -hmm. Now, what uh, what did you study today? Well, you know, as we're going through the Psalms, it's great that we focus in on what they're telling us, but sometimes we go through it so quickly that we forget to point out some of the facts about the Psalms and how they were written. So I wanted to stop today and do that with Psalm 120. Did you know that Psalm 120 is the first of 15 remarkable short Psalms known as the Songs of Degrees or the Songs of Ascent? That is from 120 up to and including 134. Now, the word translated degrees or ascents is the Hebrew mala, often translated steps, stairs, etc. It literally means to go up to a higher place. Now, most authorities believe these psalms were sung by the children of Israel as they traveled from their homes to Jerusalem for the annual ascent up to the higher elevations on which the holy city was built. Now that's interesting. So in other words, you have the, the country coming together. Yes. And they're, they're coming to Jerusalem. Yes. To worship. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. And as they come together, they're singing their different songs in different tempos at different right. places. Mm -hmm. As they come together, they begin to hear each other and they start singing yes. together. Yes. So as you go into the holy temple, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, everybody's singing together now. Yes. That is They're joined fascinating. As, as one voice. Pretty important. Pretty cool. That is when you really, really stop. And I, you know, I, I don't know of any other mm -hmm. place where, that has that program than the history. And what a witness to those that we're not from, that we're not a part of the children of Israel. No, and the, the of course the 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 whole thing is that they're worshiping mm -hmm. the one true God, and right. so it's humanity expressing themselves. You know, I think about this, and when Jesus Christ comes and all of that, and I think, you know what, that's going to be interesting because we're going to be singing you know, the same song, and as we do that, all of humanity, well, the people who are willing, are going to sing that song. That is absolutely stunning. Very good. I'm very excited about that. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is the Bible guide for you, and uh, we'll send it to you if you write to us. And when you write, send an offering in any amount. The offering just covers the cost of the guide. This is original. And anything above that will go Keeps into... The lights on. Exactly, the lights on and cameras and it running is ab enables us to be able to expand the program, expand the website. Yes, actually, Come the website. To you every day. Mm -hmm. That's very important. You can go to the website at www.thestreamtv.com and you can give your offering there. Download the PDF files and make sure that you get the Bible guide. It is rare to find people of truth in our life. Most of the laws of the land are recorded in ways that benefit some people, but not all. There are unique cases when the laws of the land reflect those that have been on record for thousands of years. The laws of God emerged 3,500 years ago with Moses. We must acknowledge these laws referred to as the Ten Commandments. The Eighth Commandment says we must never lie or give false narrative. Recognizing a lie is the key to understanding the truth. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God in three persons. This is who God is, the God of the Bible. And the Lord of the Bible brought Jesus Christ into this planet 2,000 years ago. And Jesus Christ allowed himself to be crucified by us. But then he rose again on the third day in the flesh and he said, Come to me, all you who labor under heavy laden, I will give you rest. Jesus Christ can come into your life and help you today and give you eternal life. In Jesus' name.